A quick silence. So good afternoon and welcome to the 10th annual Page Lecture, hosted in honor of artist and writer Joanne Page. Page Lecture is a highlight of the year each year here in the Department of English, during which we celebrate the alchemy that is literary art by inviting a renowned Canadian writer to reflect upon the process and the product of literary production via the evocative prompt of the page. My name is Sam McKegney and I'm the head of the English department here at Queens in Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory. And rather than a standard land acknowledgement, as we gather here and online in this most difficult of years during which mass graves have been discovered at multiple Indian residential schools, I would rather uh, like to invite audience members to on their own time, engage with the literary art of residential school survivors and intergenerational survivors. And to that effect, uh, I would like to invite you all to attend a virtual gathering that's occurring this Friday and Saturday called I Pass the Talking Stick to You, Sharing, Reading, Teaching Residential School Stories, hosted by the University of Regina. And we'll pop uh, more information about that into the Zoom chat if people are, are interested in taking that in. It's an auspicious time for creative writing here in the English department. Of course, we have the 10th anniversary of the Page Lecture, featuring Joanne Page's friend, the renowned novelist, poet, and author of creative nonfiction, Helen Humphreys, who is also a former Queen's writer in residence, and is currently teaching as part of our new adjunct writers in the community program. It's also a time during which our department is expanding curriculum in creative writing and bringing the creation and study of literature together at the core of our intellectual mission. Furthermore, no fewer than three alumni from our creative writing program have been shortlisted for this year's Governor General's Literary Awards, and uh, which is a pretty, pretty big feat, as well as creative writing alumnus and this year's writer in residence, Omar El Akkad, has been shortlisted for the 2021 Giller Prize. So, I mean, I think we should maybe take this moment to <laughs> congratulate the mentors and creative writing. So a few nuts and bolts uh, before we get things really going here. Uh, this is indeed a hybrid event. So we have some folks in the room and we have some folks uh, zooming in. Uh, please keep your mics muted if you're on Zoom. When the lecture is complete, we'll be able to have a Q&A that will involve the ability for folks in the room to ask questions. Uh, anyone who's interested in asking a question from the Zoom, uh, please put your question or type it into the chat, and we will try to curate some of those questions and bring them to the conversation here. Rather than bouncing back and forth with the audio and the tech, we'd rather you not speak uh, into the, the conversation from Zoom. Um, we've had that go awry at a few departmental meetings, so we won't do that here today. Uh, and those in the audience, please remain masked throughout the event. A few further announcements. Last year's page lecture, The Simple by Fred Waugh, is now available as a chapbook published by Maureen Scott Harris. If we could pop that up. It's coming. Um, but it is now available. There were a few uh, issues are, um, at the door, and uh, you can get it for 10 bucks online by email. Look at how stunning that is. 
Isn't that sharp? And there are also other um, page lectures available from the 10 years that this fine event has been going on. Another announcement is that this year, Phil Hall will be stepping back from his role as director of the Page Lecture Series after a decade of tireless work to make this the special event that it has become. So I really want to honor Phil's work and, and his vision and just say thanks so much for all that you've done for this. And thanks are of course also due to Steve Page and the Page family for their support of this event, which is far more than just financial. And uh, it's always a delight to work with you, Steve, and, uh, and we're grateful for all that you've done for the Page Lecture. I think that's also really good. <laughs> thanks to uh, Wanda Pramsma, Afshin Chowdhury, and Megan Bryan for bringing it all together for the logistics and technical support, uh, without which this event wouldn't happen. One final thing, uh, before I hand things over to Kirsty McLeod, author of In Praise of Retreat, Finding Sanctuary in the Modern World, to introduce this afternoon's distinguished speaker. Joanne Page was not only a gifted poet, journalist, teacher, and editor, but also an incredible visual artist. I'm honored to announce that the Queen's English Department website will, in the coming days, launch the Joanne Page Virtual Gallery which will house pieces from throughout Joanne's decades of artistic production. And we'll see some of them uh, on the background here, just a little bit of a sneak peek uh, as we go through today's event. So please keep your eyes uh, on the English department's social media feed for the official launch of that gallery in the next two weeks or so. And if you happen to have a Joanne Page painting hanging on your wall, at home, and you notice that it is not included in our gallery, please reach out to us because we would like to get as many of those pieces of, of beautiful art together as possible. So uh, thanks for your time. And I am now going to ask you to join me in welcoming Kirstine McLeod to introduce our speaker. Thanks so much, Sam. And uh, thank you all, everyone who's been involved in organizing the Page Lectures. I really have uh, come to enjoy them. And I'm extra delighted uh, this year to be invited to introduce uh, Helen Humphreys, who's going to be doing the 10th lecture in this series uh, today. Her lecture is called The Annotated Page, and it's in honor of her friend, the poet and painter, Joanne Page. Um, Helen is known as a very gifted writer, uh, probably one of the most gifted writers in Canada, and she's acclaimed internationally for her vivid and lyrical and lucid poetry and prose. Um, I was thinking a little bit about her legacy. She told me not to talk about all of her books, <laughs> and I thought that's good she said that because she actually has 20 books um, when her next one comes out, so we would have been here all day. Um, uh, so at the moment, she's got 19 books. Uh, she's won all kinds of scores of awards. I won't go into that either because there are lots of them. Um, and she um, has won tons of awards for um, collections of poetry. So a, a vast stretch of kinds of work um, that always seems to be changing. So she started with poetry, then she had award-winning novels. Then she started writing a lot more creative nonfiction. And if you've been reading her nonfiction, you'll realize that uh, sometimes it's an interesting hybrid of genres, so there might be some fictional interludes or some poetry in there. Um, and Helen continues to evolve in this way. Um, if you've seen her latest book, which is called uh, Field Study, um, uh, Meditations on a Year at the Herbarium, um, it's actually a, a visit that she made to the Queen's Herbarium. You'll see uh, various specimens in there, but also botanical drawings that Helen herself has done because she's been teaching herself to draw over the past couple of years. And I can't help but imagine that this is something that Joanne would really approve of. <laughs> so uh, Joanne and Helen have been friends. Uh, they met at the BAM Center for the Arts, which seems really fitting. And they had a lovely long artistic friendship that involved a lot of uh, um, adventures together. So a few I've heard of casually uh, were the uh, voyage to Antarctica, <laughs> which sounded very interesting. There was a train trip across Canada and uh, closer to home, there was also a walk, a, a very long walk on very thin ice. <laughs> and I can see some of you laughing in recognition because you probably read the ghost story. 
which is a book that uh, Helen describes uh, a little bit of this. I think both Helen and Joanne did uh, do various things uh, related to this trip uh, in their artwork. Um, and uh, the book, The Ghost Orchid, is just really suffused with Joanne's presence and it was dedicated to her memory as well. It's a very lovely book. So if you haven't seen it, uh, that will give you more insights into, uh, a little more insight into Joanne and Helen's friendship. Um, yeah, so now I just want to call on Helen to um, talk a little bit um, about uh, the annotated page. I'm really looking forward to hearing her thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming today. And thanks, hello to everyone in Zoomland. Thank you, Boston, for coming. Um, uh, this was really hard for me to write because I, I, it, I knew Joanne well, so it made it that much harder. So I, I, um, I'm not just going to start. I'm not going to explain myself. <laughs> there we go. I first met Joanne Page in 1995 at the Banff Center for the Arts. She was there as a participant in the writing program, and I was staying at one of the Leighton Studios, working on a book of poetry. Usually the experience of being at the Leighton Studios was a fairly solitary one. But because I was a writer there at the same time as the writing program was in session, I was invited to their readings and parties. I met Joanne at one of these parties. She was sitting cross-legged on the carpet, drinking a beer, cheerfully talking poetry with her fellow writing residents. We were introduced and quickly discovered that we both lived in Easton, Ontario, me in Ottawa and Joanne in Kingston. The Leighton Studios were individual studios designed by different architects and built in the woods away from the main complex. They varied wildly. One was round, another was mostly glass, another curled inside like a shell. The studio I had been given was an old fishing trawler that was known as the boat. It was smaller than the others because it was an actual boat. You climbed some exterior stairs and then walked down into it. The main work area was narrow and kind of sunken. There was a small kitchenette that was up a few steps in the wheelhouse where the spoked captain's wheel still turned. And there was a tiny washroom crammed into the bow where once there would have been ropes and anchor chain. The boat was generally regarded as being the worst latent studio because it was so cramped. You couldn't even stand up straight in the washroom and the main part of the boat was so narrow that I could stretch out my arms and touch either side of the cabin. But I liked the space. I found the confines reassuring and conducive to writing. Also, it had the most well-equipped kitchenette of any of the studios, and I was cooking all my meals there, having opted out of the meal plan and getting my own groceries instead once a week from town. The last inhabitant of the boat must have had the same idea because a bear had been attracted by the smell of food and had climbed up the side deck and pressed his or her face against the windows to look inside. The snout and paw prints were still visible on the window above the sink, and I liked to look at them while I was making supper. The boat was up on a bit of a rise and positioned in the midst of the other lady studios. It had a very good vantage point and was particularly well placed in relation to the all glass studio. Many an evening, I sat up in the wheelhouse of the boat and watched the resident in the glass studio drink wine or walk around. <laughs> it was actually impossible not to watch as the studio lit up like a fishbowl at night and was the brightest, most visible thing in the woods. I was at the Leighton Studios for the purpose of working on poetry, but I had recently lost faith in poetry. So what I was doing instead was reading the dictionary and writing down any of the words that still held meaning for me. Out of these words, I built poems, but slowly and laboriously, often just saying a word over and over out loud until I could think of another word to put beside it. The members of the writing studio were invited to tour the late studios. It was impossible to have many people at a time on the boat, so they filed up singly, most admitting the space felt too claustrophobic for them. But Joanne liked the boat cabin and could see the romance in it. She also liked the snout and paw marks on the window. I ended up moving to Kingston in 1997 and became reacquainted with Joanne there, meeting at poetry readings and going to a party once at her house on Livingston. One evening we had dinner on the Shea Piggy patio 
back when they had a magnificent magnolia tree presiding over the courtyard. I don't remember who else was there, if indeed anyone was, but I do remember that it was a beautiful warm spring night with a full moon and that Joanne was wearing a light blue shirt. After dinner, saying goodbye on Princess Street, she opened her arms wide to exclaim on the gloriousness of being alive, attracting a few disapproving glances from passers-by. One of the big things I miss about Joanne is that enthusiasm for life and the people she loved for art and writing, nature, gardens, adventure. So on this 10th anniversary of the Page Lecture, I have gone looking for the Joanne I remember to see where she might still be lurking. The title of this talk is The Annotated Page. I mean page as in Joanne, but also as in the page itself, Joanne's pages. When Joanne was beginning a sequence of poems that would ultim ultimately become A Brief History of Snow, published in her book Watermarks by Beth Follett of Peddler Press, we met for our daily walk at the cul-de-sac on the army base. Joanne had a type sheet of paper that she waved at me when she got out of her car. I think I'm onto something, she said. The poem was this one. Downtown Norwich and Julian's unfailing good humor is tested through another round of bubonic plague. Half a mile away by the river, Lollards burn in the Lollards pit. Soon the peasants will revolt, revolt, but never fear. All shall be well and all shall be and so on until cooped up in her anchor hold, she snaps. No one will ever know that far from devotional, the famous that it is so without end is scribbled down in a freak May storm. I read it while we stood in the road and the snow fell around us. I loved the poem from that first reading. And yet when I go and look there for Joanne, I don't find her in the perfect presentation of the poem in the finished book, beautiful as both are. I don't see her excited face or the folded piece of paper with the words dissolving in the melting snowflakes. I don't see the dark green background of the trees or our two cars or my old dog nosing around at the edge of the wood. But when I look through some of her books, the ones she owned, not the ones she wrote, I get little glimpses of her in the annotations she has scrawled in the margins. The thing with annotations is that they are a response, often an immediate response. A text speaks to us at a particular moment and we feel compelled to answer back in that same moment. It is the unguarded self who answers, not the composed or composing self. The unguarded self when encountered in both ourselves or in another person always feels fresh and authentic and is perhaps the true self, or at least the one that feels truest, the self without affect. When you annotate a text, you are speaking to the author, but it is not a conversation. The author doesn't answer back. And so you can say whatever you want. There is no fear of making the wrong comment or of hurting the author's feelings. No one else will probably ever pick up that book and read what you have written. The annotated text is personal and private. It's a personal response to an intimate stranger, which is what an author is when we encounter them on the page. An intimate stranger, what a delicious concept. This is part of what makes reading so compelling, I think, this intimate communion between two strangers, the reader and the writer. Joanne was fond of a little book called Mute Objects of Expression by a mid 20th century French writer named Francis Ponge. Ponge was ostensibly a poet, but had trained in philosophy and law. His desire was to animate everyday objects with a mix of poetry, philosophy, personal interjection, classical mythology, and whatever else was lying around to throw into the mix. His books are hard to define, which is part of what makes them so interesting. Mute Objects of Expression was written in 1942 in a small notebook that was Ponge's entire meager wartime supply of paper. In the book, Ponge turns his attention to the banks of the Loire, a bird, a wasp, a carnation, a mimosa plant, and spends at least half of the small volume talking about a pine wood. Often the things to which he has turned his attention do not do enough to satisfy him, and he loses patience with them. Of the pine wood, he says, rise up, pine woods, rise up in speech. We don't know you. Show us what you are made of. It is not for nothing that you have been noticed by F. Ponge. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne has drawn an arrow in the margins towards this passage and written beside it, rise up, pine woods. 
<laughs> this little note still translates her delight and mockery at Ponge's impatience with the object of his study. And it brings back to me one of the things I liked best about Joanne. She was funny. She was funny and she found humor in a lot of different situations and people. In the little essay Ponge writes about a bird, Joanne has put brackets around a small stanza to single it out from the others, to remember it perhaps, or just to mark it as having been important to her upon reading. All in all, there still remains, writes Ponge, the scattered undisciplined flocks, birds like wooden spigots that creak and squeak, that cheep and chirp. Ponge walked about in the pine woods or along the banks of the Loire for his inspiration. Joanne and I walked out on the ice of the river one winter for ours. Elements from those walks taken together made their way into our individual poems and stories. Joanne made some paintings of the shore ice that prefigured her later paintings of ice and icebergs and water. Late into that winter of ice walking in early March, we decided to walk over the river ice from Kingston began in Ockwick. We had supplies, sandwiches and tea, extra socks, and a kick sled to carry the knapsack with the supplies and to use to rest on during the journey. The walk took all day and the ice was soft or non-existent in parts, so we had to vary our route accordingly. But we made it and there was a feeling of triumph in having done it. We both felt proud of the walk and considered it one of our best accomplishments. Joanne wrote a poem about our ice walking winter, which she never finished to her satisfaction and gave to me at some point in the process of writing it. The poem was very much the first draft and Joanne has annotated it with little notes to herself about where or how to make improvements to the text. Here's the poem she called Bateau Channel. In my 62nd winter, I set down this account of walking on the water of the great river week upon week against a blue sky blaze, laying down my text of footfalls among notations of wolf and deer, sliding over mica, ice pressure fractured, the river white, groaning, booming beneath, imprisoned, held under but never captive. No wind for days, no cloud to break the grip of deep cold, notched tighter under moonlight. Here and there, open water, black as night or sudden death. Why are we here? For we are two flirting at oblivion to feel alive. The poem is heavily annotated in pencil. At the top, Joanne has written, too much comfort, there is clear and present danger. The writer unhoused from language, a painter blinded. Down the side of the paper, she has tried out different words or phrases as replacements for those already in the poem, and then has a note about the tone of the piece. Protest laughable versus indifference, condescension. <laughs> At the bottom of the page is written, economy of essential, and she has complained to herself about the ending, calling it throwaway, and writing improve beside it, with an exclamation <laughs> point and an underline for emphasis. <laughs> it's Joanne writing notes to herself, but the notes feel more vital to me than the poem. In dispensing with the chronology, she is focused in on the heart of the problem, which is whether the poem is too safe for its subject matter. And because she stopped working on it, she must have concluded that it was, but couldn't figure out a way to fix that or lost interest in doing so. When she gave it to me, she probably also gave me an explanation for the unfinished state of the poem, but I can't remember any of this now. Memory is a fickle creature. Time takes away whole conversations, but gives the vividness of a blue shirt, a spring full moon, the mist covered trees along the shore when Joanne and I walked out on the river ice. Annotated text was a conceit that Joanne liked very much. One of her favorite poems by the American poet Billy Collins in his book, Picnic Lightning, was a poem called Marginalia. Collins writes, we have all seized the white perimeters as our own and reached for a pen, if only to show we did not just laze in an armchair turning pages. We press a thought into the wayside planted an impression along the verge. Even Irish monks in their cold scriptoria jotted along the borders of the gospels, brief asides about the pains of copying, a bird singing near their window or the sunlight that illuminated their page, anonymous men catching a ride into the future on a vessel more lasting than themselves. Joanne's final body of work was a series of watercolor paintings that she wrote on and over. 
I remember her excitement when she started making these, when she started annotating her own artwork. Sometimes the paintings were aligned with the text scrawled over them, and sometimes the relationship between the two was less obvious. One painting called A Map of Last Week is a documentary of all the small commonplace occurrences within the span of a week, many of them simply meals or walks or ordinary domestic activities like drying boot liners. The annotations are playful and cheerful. Of an afternoon spent being a visiting writer to an English class, she writes, blah, 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 English class. <laughs> Another painting is a still life of food with the fabulous title, Map for Organizing a Large Banquet in the French Style by Way of the Famous Collapsing Dutch Still Life. <laughs> the marginalia around the outside of the painting details various courses of the meal. In islands of night thoughts, some of the islands have tangles of phrases and others have but a single word or phrase. Alone is the word on a small island in the middle of the painting. Another island has the line, come home, all is forgiven, inscribed on it. One island contains words that have to do with measurement, line, point, order, mathematic, and then has the phrase has been stuck in the middle of these ordered night thoughts. These annotated paintings were made after Joanne had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. So there is undoubtedly some address to this within the writing. Is it better to love or be loved? Joanne asks on one island. And then on another, she says, you give from what you gain. I have one of these annotated paintings. I think it's going behind me somewhere. Mine is of a pond. The colors are mainly dark blue and yellow, although there is the tiniest slash of red near the top right hand of the corner of the painting. The words are mostly clustered together at the bottom of the pond, as though they have sunk. They are written in pencil and overlap a lot, so it is hard to pick out individual words and phrases with the naked eye. But using a magnifying glass produces better results, although I have resisted doing a forensic examination of the painting and finding out all of what is written there. I prefer the words to remain mysterious, just like something at the base of an actual pond would be to one still on shore. The water would hide what was there as the watercolor of the painting obscures the words. What I like is to stand back from the painting and look at it. At a distance, the words aren't obvious and just appear as shading on the bottom of the pond. I think now how clever this was on Joanne's part. Her thoughts are hidden unless you, the viewer, are really interested in seeking them out, in which case you move right up to the painting, shine a light onto it, or use a magnifying glass to decipher what is written there. But if you don't choose to do that, it is still a beautiful watercolor of a pond and can be enjoyed as such. This is where Joanne lives for me now, in those secret words. I think of them like seeds, and I use them to grow my own words. When I'm stuck in my writing or when I need a place to start, I will go to the painting and take a word or two. It is much the same exercise I did well over 20 years ago when I first met Joanne in Banff and when I was trolling through the dictionary in search of words that still held meaning for me. But now the words have meaning because they are Joanne's words, because they were words that she chose first and my echo is a kind of memorial to her, or at least I like to think of it that way. There are two words floating in the center of my painting, even love, both capitalized. When I was writing The Ghost Orchard, a book that is partially about my friendship with Joanne, I took those words as the start of a little address at the end of the book that was written directly to Joanne. Even love, even rain, the fox crossing the leafy avenue, darkness lifting from the field, the wet ring on the table under the beer glass, the scent of lilacs on the hill, even laughter, even breath won't remember you. Nevertheless, you are still there in the line of morning song outside the window, the dark plum of dusk, the dream, in the scatter of words on a page, the rise of green before the wild orchard. By using Joanne's words, I am remembering her for myself in a vivid living way. And I hope that all of you listening to this today will have a look at these annotated paintings in the virtual gallery when it is available. And I hope that you will take a word or two for yourselves, a seed to grow into a story or a poem or a letter to someone you love. I'm pretty sure Joanne will be on board with that. Thank you for listening.
so much, Helen, for that beautiful, beautiful talk. And I know that that will uh, ignite some, some interest and some questions from our audience. And uh, I would like to open that up now. If people have, have questions or, or, or comments and folks on the Zoom call are welcome to type yours into the chat and I will take out some of those in a moment. But so I hand over to you. So uh, what would you describe as the best parts of your friendship with Joanne? Like uh, the most, uh, the most uh, highlighting like, uh, like of it. The best thing were all the adventures for sure. Not no question, like the walk on the ice and various things we did. Um, yeah, we, yeah, I think that for me anyway, that was, that was, that was my favorite part. <laughs> you talked um, sometimes about annotations that were there to be found, but then also those private annotations that weren't ever meant for someone to be seen. Do you, do you feel differently about those different kinds of annotations? Do you engage with them differently? Well, I think all of these were private annotations that I'm talking about because they were all either in books of Joanne's that I own now or on a poem that she gave to me. So, so I was thinking of the paintings. Oh, the paintings, books. yeah. yeah. Um, well, the paintings were public. They weren't meant to be private paintings. Mm -hmm. So they were meant to be seen. I don't think she put them to, to not be seen, so. I think they were, it's just that you have to look for them. So it was clever, you know, to, to really, well, this one's easier to read, but my poem one is very difficult. It's got things that are overlapped. And so you have to you know, get right up. You have to make the effort. So, so I don't, yeah, I can't answer your question really, but that's what I think about them right now. One question, uh, I, I, I found that so fascinating the the intimate stranger as a way of really understanding the reading experience and engaging with an author who you don't know and uh given how you were discussing the way that joanne annotated so much and was always in dialogue it seems with authors she was reading i'm wondering if that intimate relationship that one has as a reader to an author is always referencing those other relationships. In other words, the author is bringing those relationships of their reading experience into it. Does that yeah, gel with what you're that saying? That makes sense or? to me, yeah, for sure. But, but a lot of that would be invisible, right? But mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Uh, it's frame that as a question, really. Yeah. <laughs> no, <okay. laughs> other, other questions from the audience or, or comments, re responses and reactions to uh, that? Kind of thank you so much. That was really wonderful. I'm thinking about the choice of the word annotation and the fact that you know it's about the dictionary and people's dictionary and we discussed this early in the conversation about relationships, how we find the same situation and all that. And then also how in our general um looking about Magnalia, but I think about footnotes and so also the form of annotation in a way of gesture is what we've done this stuff before. And I'm, I really appreciate how you make conversation about creating and cementing a relationship, which may or may not be private, but it depends on who's giving it, and it depends on who's responding to it. And how that in turn changes our understanding of what reading the vision experience is, right? Mm -hmm. How we can come to recognize what you know. Uh, just it's just so good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for these comments. Um, you talked about annotations being like the, the trigger spell to the theology. And I'm wondering about Joanne's painting where she annotated down the very next page to the right one. Because you also, in your opinion, show a trigger spell or that we didn't have to look for them or whatever. Yeah, I mean, they did, they did to me, like as somebody who knew Joanne, I don't go to her published books anymore to look for her, you know, when I want to feel the kind of essence of her, I go to the paintings where the little notes are. So for, yes, that's how it's worked for me. I, I think that that has become, because in that direct response or, or the way she was responding to a painting where I don't, you know, writing on it, that feels still more alive to me than something, you know, because a text in a book is being worked over multiple times. It's being worked with an editor and it's being this, this and that has happened to it. So in a way it loses some of its life force by becoming ready to be published. Whereas something like the paintings don't, I feel. That. Yeah, I have a question to build on that. Um, 
Sorry, I'm like <laughs> wavering on the edge of emotion right now. It was all so, so beautiful. And um, as someone with sort of a, a, a personal experience of losing a friend who you shared so much creativity with, someone who was such a creative partner, um, does it feel maybe like um, in the annotations of the paintings, especially since some of the words are still a mystery. I remember there was a very clear moment for me when I lost this person where I read sort of the last thing that she had written and then that was it. And so does it feel like, you know, with those paintings and those blurry words that will never quite be fully figured out, does it, does it feel like she still potentially has more left to discover? Yeah, that? for sure. And that's why I don't, I don't do the forensic with my own painting, I don't do the forensic analysis. I just kind of look at it and take out a few. Yeah, for sure, because there's still more to to find there. Because I know that feeling and that happened, you know, with my brother and he died. There was this, this, this kind of limitless, for a while anyway, a limitless ca cache of stuff. And then all of a sudden it comes to an end and it's like, oh, okay, no more phone messages to listen to, no more letters to read. Yeah, so. I really enjoyed one of the lines during your presentation. You said memory was a fickle creature, like a, I mean, memory, but I find that quote very, very deep, you know, because like, especially when it relates to items like paintings and poems, like remainders of a person after they're gone, right? Like every person is concerned with how their legacy would like would continue after, after they pass on. It's like, you know, like, it's a fundamental part of who we are. We want to see how we're, how we're regarded by future generations and such. And like, um, but like, like you said, though, the memory is fickle, right? It, it, it doesn't always go down a straight route. And like, I, I was just wondering, like, uh, like with all this talk of legacy and such, do you see memory as kind of a is memory? Uh, how do you say it? Is like, it, it is, it's hard to tell. Like, it's hard to say. Like, is memory and like, is, I think memory is like somewhat ambiguous right, in terms of its, um, in terms of its uh, treatment for the person. Like a, I'll get you yeah, it's I think it's faulty, isn't it? I mean, you, you forget lots of things and then you remember very specific things uh, kind of out, of out of the blue. So yeah, it can't really be trusted, but we have that's what we have. <laughs> so <laughs> we have to rely on it somewhat, but it can't necessarily be trusted. Um, you, you talked a lot about like um this idea of annotations being this sort of reading annotations being this space of intimate experience and then I mean especially for someone you're close to but at the same time like when a piece of art is published is out in the world it can and will be interpreted in every direction imaginable as a reality of art so I'm just wondering what do you what do you make of that when you are reading when people interpret things from someone you you better than most, I suppose. Like, how, how do you sort of react to those, that kind of thing? Um, well, I, you have no control over that part of it, how things are interpreted. So I don't, I just don't pay any attention, I don't think, really, because everybody just has their own interpretation of something. You know, I have my interpretation of Joanna that, you know, this, this is it, but somebody else has a different interpretation. And, and then some stranger will have a different interpretation again. So I, I just let, yeah, I don't, there's no right, there's no right way to think about somebody or something. I thought that was brilliant. And I wonder if you had any reflection on the fact that you're talking about annotation in Joanne's work in the George Wally room. There's Professor Wally on the wall there. And he's known for a book on Coleridge's Anna, Coleridge's Marginalia. <laughs> That's not really a question, but <laughs> if you'd like to acknowledge Professor Wally. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, very beautiful. Very beautiful. Um, I never knew you on page, but I picked up her book. Um, a, a book of poetry, and she had a poem about um, my former doctor, Sally Sharp, going through her daughter's clothes after her daughter killed herself. 
and um, really getting from me. Um, so I'm just thinking of you've been talking about joint books. Um, do you have objects? Because I have objects for my father, like things. Um, they own and touched and so on. So do you also have objects that belong to like Mary Page that mean something in a different way? Yeah, I mean, I have some of her books, like the Francis Ponge book, We Have Objects of Expression, which is now mine, and um, <laughs> the painting, and a couple of other little paintings. And so, yeah. It's all creative work, so that you. Oh, yeah. yes, rather than actual objects. Yeah, I think it's mostly creative yeah, work. That's yeah, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I, I was wondering if um, Joanne ever. Um, wrote marginalia in any of your books um <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question i don't know i've never looked through my books and then she had <laughs> she could have maybe i hate this <laughs> <laughs> terrible poem <laughs> that's great i have to find them for people who have those books <laughs> helen yeah um, taxi bowls from the uh from the chat um, his sister asks, can you please speak about Joanne's ability to tell a great story? That's a terrible question, Patsy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Joanne, well, she's a good storyteller. I mean, what can I say about that? I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to just like tell one of Joanne's stories, but I don't, I can't, you know, nothing's coming to mind. So yes, she was a good storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> That's incorporate. Yeah, it's incorporate. <laughs> I was wondering, I was struck when you were talking about Island of Night Thoughts. Islands of Night Thoughts. I was going to ask because I was struck when you were talking about uh, Banff and the boat. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned it was a time in which you lost faith in poetry. I wondered if you might contextualize that a bit for us. Why have you lost faith? Have you found faith again? What you know, what, what's your relationship to poetry? What, what did you mean by it? Well, periodically this thing happens. That was the first time it happened, so I thought it was momentous, but as it turns out, it's the thing that happens to me pretty regularly. <laughs> so now I don't even pay attention to what happens. <laughs> periodically I just lose faith of writing completely and what and, and I have to try to find my way back to it. And so that was how I just decided to do it with poetry was I, I was really worried because I had lost faith. I thought I could never I could never uh, write it again. And so I was just going to the dictionary like that. But it does happen to me fairly regularly. So now I kind of just figure out, you know, I just always have to figure out some way to re-engage with it, I guess. I think it's like any any long relationship, it needs reanimation at a certain point. And I've been a writer since I was a child, and, and I'm pretty much a full-time writer. All of my life so it's a long long relationship and periodically i need to find my way back into it so this seems to happen every few years i lose faith in something but poetry never came back i wrote another book but it didn't come back really it's you know i haven't read the book of poetry since 1999 mm -hmm. so it has kind of drifted away but that's okay <laughs> What you said about finding her in her annotation instead of her published poetry is really interesting. And her book annotation is also beautiful moving. But what sort of, you know, it's this idea that there's a different self in her published book. So, but that's obviously the self that she was presenting to the world um, and that she would have spent a lot of time sort of creating. And I imagine you've done the same in your own published work. So, I, well, who is, you know, who is that? If it's not really the friend that you knew who's in the published work, then what kind of self exists in an author's published? Yeah, it's that's a really good question. I'd say uh, a kind of mediated self because, you know, it's never, when you publish something, you, you're not just doing it by, your, by, by yourself. You're dealing with editors and publishers and a lot of people who want you, to, who have input on your work and want, you to do different things with it. So by the time it actually appears, there is some, co it's a compromised version usually of the of version initially. So that's something that's being worked on and maybe it's like the best, it's the best version you think, but it's not the most, I don't know, it's maybe not the freshest, right? Uh, that, so that's all. And, and I think when we look for people who aren't there anymore, I mean, the, the best thing is to have the person still there because then you're dealing with them. But when they're not there, we're looking for the kind of the liveliest place 
to engage with them, right? And, and sometimes the published work, I think, is it's too overworked. It's too perfect on its perfect page. I mean, you know, five different hands have suggested different things and it's, it's being worked on for years, but the annotation has been written in a moment, right? Of emotional response to something. So there's something still alive for me in that, that in the published work isn't alive in that, that same way. That's, so, Jesse? Yeah, I'm just, I'm really interested by that, that idea. Is there something about the, the, the physicality of, of Joanna having had the book written in the book, it's her hand, a pen, is there, is there that kind of physical object connection to it as well, emotional connection? Yeah, absolutely, right? The, the pen, the, you know, um, I think Rise Up Pine Woods <laughs> is written in, it's written really largely. So, you know, it's like, it's emphatic, right? She, she put the exclamation marks after Rise Up and Pine Woods. So really emphatic, big hammer. So you can tell something, right? It's, it's sort of, it's, it's you're looking at it forensically. And so, so there's things that you can you can tell about it. I remember looking at someone's um, notebook and realizing that everything was smudged. I was thinking, what? And then I realized that they must have been writing outside and it was raining <laughs> because it was you know smudging the words, right? So, so there's those those little things you can decipher from from the living moment that you can't find out when a text has been worked over for years and published in a book. That li that living moment is kind of some ways back. Question yeah, yeah, for sure. So I actually took those pictures of the paintings thanks to you, Deja. <laughs> and so the, the, I wasn't trying to like you decode the painting per se, but I was zooming in and suddenly words were emerging. I was like, aha, so that's <laughs> what you're trying to say. And I was wondering if um, during your time, if unintentionally you read the annotations of the paintings and any messages that came to you when they initially did it before, if you feel like that's an ongoing living conversation when it does. Yeah, it, it's not like, nothing's kind of a message to me, but it's something that I say, like I use as a seed to, to grow something else. So, so I don't, um, I don't feel there's mess, you know, because Jan didn't even know I was going to get that painting, I think. I'm not sure, I can't remember. So it's not that it's specific to me, but it's, to me, it's still, you know, I can still find Joanne in there. And so I just, you know, take a word, walk by and like look at something and think, okay, take a word that makes sense to me and then use it and make something else. And it never fails actually. It feels like a, li a lively, a live thing for me to be doing because it, it never fails to generate other words. So, so I enjoy it, the practice of it anyway. It seems to work for me. Yeah, um, I'm really, I, I was really, uh, really touched by the the way you, you said that these are these are Joanne's words that you're you're taking at, at the end there and, and building the seeds and sorry I'm a little choked up here um, and uh, the the similarity to the practice of, of taking the words from the dictionary and how this is there's still single words that you're picking out um, but they you describe them as being her words at that point and I'm wondering how those words work differently for you as Joanne's words, as just words that you pick from somewhere else. Yeah, I think I don't need as many of them. I, I, maybe that's one thing. Like I can you know, take a couple or even one, or even that little phrase, even love, and I wrote those two paragraphs. But, so I don't need as many, because I guess they, there's more resonance for me in those than if there was just trolling through the dictionary thinking, you know, all these words are meaningless except for you know the word house or something there I was doing. So it has it has more emotional resonance and I can build on that emotional resonance. Um, so so I don't need as many. It's, it's, it's a smaller enterprise or I'm that much older and I don't need as many anyway anymore. So. <laughs> well we probably have time for one or two more questions and I want to stress to the, the folks on Zoom that uh, your beautiful comments that I, I see coming up um, in gratitude for the presentation, will be shared with Helen after the fact. You can't read them now, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe one or two more questions. Can you annotate your own books? I don't. I don't mean books that you've written, but the books that you read. Do you? No, I don't. I don't usually. Does this make? Yeah, it makes me want own? to. Some, yeah, something want to. I really love. Although, 
the ones I really love, I wouldn't want to mark them, I guess. I feel, I feel, I don't know, weird about marking them, but yeah, it does, it does kind of make me do that. There's another interesting question from the chat here, and this okay. is from Beth Falda. Um, Helen, sorry, has uh, Joanne's annotations of her books, the ones that you now have, and your reading of the annotation changed your way of responding or engaging with books? And she continues, do you ever hear Joanne, uh, bracket, brazen voice, and bracket, accompanying your own responses to books? Not usually to books, sometimes to people. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so, well, I mean, thank you so much for the you. beauty of your presentation today, the, the care and the relationships that you brought into this room, and uh, for your generosity with the answering of questions. Uh, please, everyone, join me in thanking Helen Humphreys for today's stage lecture. So you can continue writing last comments you want to share with, with Helen. I'm just going to mute this here, but thanks so much for your attendance on Zoom. I appreciate it.